and gentlemen, it is the one and only Edward Willett. He is back, and he is you, you. This is your third Kickstarter, isn't it? It's the third one, yeah. And yeah, so they've all succeeded, so I guess I'll keep doing it. Well, that, I, I, well, obviously, I, I mean, the big, the big one for the last month was Brandon Sanderson's big, like record breaking. Yeah, I didn't quite... <laughs> no, but, but I, I think one of the things I did kind of want to talk to you about because just you've been doing it. And for you've been doing like it's not just you. There's been a lot of authors that have quietly have been turning Kickstarter into a publishing kind of a, a deal for a last little while. And I think I think all Sanderson did was cement that yeah, this is a viable option. But why did you actually choose it originally? Well, there was no way I could do the project if I didn't have money up front. I was not going to talk to the kind of authors that I was inviting, the, who are all guests on my podcast, The World Shapers. I mean, these are people like John Scalzi and Joe Haldeman and Sean and McGuire and David Brin. You know, I wasn't going to go to them and say, well, uh, I'll pay you a penny a word. You know, that wasn't going to happen. So I set uh, 10 cents a word as the minimum I would pay. And as soon as I did that, that set a pretty high level of funding I had to have in place before I could even think about doing this. Um, and so, well, the Kickstarter, the other thing was that uh, I saw a presentation. I'm a member of Sask Books, which is the Saskatchewan Publishing Association. In fact, I'm vice president now. Wow. Um, and um, yeah, somebody else quit the board and I said, okay, I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that later in maybe a minute too. That's cool. I was not elected to be vice president, but I was not rejected when they needed somebody. So I guess I was elected. Anyway, uh, they had a presentation at the annual meeting in 2018 from a publisher from Winnipeg who had done an anthology Kickstarter and she'd raised a hundred thousand uh -huh. dollars. Um, I thought, well, I know some authors now she had comics connections and the comics community is really big on Kickstarters. I know. I That's where a lot, a lot of, if you look at the projects, a lot of them are graphic novels or something like that. Uh, so anyway, uh, she had done it and I thought, well, I know some authors because the podcasts have been running for a while. And of course I've met a lot of writers as a writer myself. And uh, I asked my guests, uh, it took me a while to climb the learning curve and decide to, to take the plunge, but I did it. And uh, the first one succeeded. And then I thought, well, I'll do it again. And the second one succeeded. And I thought, well, I'll do it again. <laughs> and the third one has now succeeded and still has a few days left as we as we do this. Yeah, well, it can, well congratulations, first and foremost. That's really cool. That's a really, really cool uh, deal. So I, so for those people, that, like you mentioned, the Shaper World, so the requirement for you to get into anthologies, they have to be a guest on your show? Yeah, that was yeah. the premise right from the beginning. Uh, because I was talking to such wonderful authors and the one year, two year thing just kind of worked out. I had to cut it off somewhere and that seemed like a logical way to do it. So the first year I had nine original stories and nine reprints because I do open it to reprints as well. Last year I had 24 stories, 18 of them were original and only six reprints. So there were more original stories in last year's anthology than in the entire first anthology. Uh, yeah, last year's was a monster. Well, I have it here. It's like 500 and... Yes, forty pages. So it's a it's a sizable chunk of book, <laughs> and uh, the new one has uh, twenty one authors. So it'll and I already know some of them are providing quite long stories. I I'm paying ten cents a word Canadian for original fiction and five cents a word for reprints. Although I do cap it at uh, six thousand words or six hundred dollars, uh, because some people are giving me ten thousand word stories and and so forth. So I did have to put a cap on it. Yes. Uh, no. Yeah. Everybody has been very very supportive. It's a, it's a cool concept. So it's like science fiction anthologies. Some of some of the all time coolest ones are like legends, right? I don't know if you if you ever read that if you ever read that one. There was another one called I think it was called Horizons. It was the science fiction equivalent to Legends, where they, the science fiction universes were were done. Well, I go back. Uh, I mean, I started reading anthologies. A lot of my early science. In fact, on you can see right there. Look, I put my finger in the right place. Those yes. two gray books there are anthologies from the fifties. Uh, Treasury of Science Fiction. Ah. And I remember reading those as a kid. And uh, then, of course, there was Dangerous Visions uh, by Harlan Ellison, uh, one of the classics in the field. So anthologies and anthologies and I go way back. Ah, Here's there you cool. go. Here's a cool <laughs> one right there. I So my first, my, so my first novels for science fiction were Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov. But my first actual foray into science fiction was the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that anthology, but there's a lot of good ones in that one. So right. I used yeah. to read those. I always read the Nebula Awards anthologies. I used to read all of those. Um, yeah. When I, 
when I was a teenager in particular, I, I gravitated quite a bit to, to short fiction um, and uh, also novels, obviously. But. <laughs> well, yo, know, I mean, I think the cool thing about about science fiction is like the short fiction was is still a very viable thing. In some ways, it's more viable today because it's just the options of you can make an audio production podcast first or you can still submit to some of the magazines that are still out there. Heck, I've even seen some Patreon slash Kickstarter models where they um, a story is released every month or every yeah. week, right? I've talked to others who do that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 a very like short stories are very cool. Um, they, they're it's a great way to. It's unfortunate that I personally don't gravitate to writing short stories because there's all this. Opportunity. Oh, it's harder. It's harder than it than it sounds. Like I just did. I'm doing one right now. I'm doing a thousand word short story for an anthology. It's going to be in a Kickstarter actually. And uh, it, it, it's a, it's a very niche one thing, but it's, it's fun. But yeah, it, they're not easy to write. Like they're they they you have to have a very clear idea of where you're starting and where you're finishing. And it's not you don't have as much. No matter even with novels, sometimes you know this. You don't have as much room as you think you do. And your yeah. short story is even worse. It's like I I I I, I can say nothing. Like what, what, like sometimes all you can do is like a punchline sometimes. Well, I, I think the best example of how I gravitate to, to novels is my very first novel published by Daw was called Lost in Translation. And it began as a, a shortish story. It was 18 pages when it was published. So it wasn't a terribly short story to begin with. And uh, already in there, I had created this, this, uh, you know, all that world building had gone into that short story that clearly would support a novel. And, and I even remember one of the reviews of it at the time said that it, built a better space opera universe than some entire novels did. And I thought, hey, maybe I should write a novel. Yeah. Uh, so uh, all hey. my all my ideas tend to be more towards something that could be expanded into uh, into novels. And even I have short stories in these anthologies. Uh, the first one was very much a standalone short story. The, the last one was actually a, a prequel to the novel I have coming out this this uh, fall from Daw. And it was technically a chunk of it was a portion of the novel, which is a flashback in the novel. And then I, I pulled it out and dramatized it as a happening in the short story world as well. And I'll write one for this coming up one too. I have no idea what that's going to be yet. I do have a character name because one of my backers rewards was a, you know, what we call a tuckerization where you use somebody's name for a character. So I know I have a, I have a character name and the character name is really cool because the, the name is Winter, W-Y-N-T-E-R. And I can practically build a whole story idea just around that name. So. That's really cool. <laughs> Well, I actually think some of the best short stories feel like they're more. Um, my favorite, my favorite short story writers are Ray Bradbury, Charles DeLint, and Stephen King. Mm -hmm. Right? I think Stephen King is at his best in the not like at the novella length. Like, his, like his novellas are fantastic, but he does some really cool short story yarns. Um, and I, I grew up. It, sometimes his novels could use a little shortening and editing. I think, so what? I, I'm not going to question his like his 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 like like his results. I'm not going to question it. No, but, you know, can't really. <laughs> yeah, no, but I I know like okay, it's so like like the stand abridged. I prefer the abridged version of the stand to the unabridged version of the stand. It just that's just a personal thing. I thought the that one was better because it was tighter. But there's something about him when he writes when he goes short. He really knows how to get you right in and right out, and almost all of his stuff feels like they're tying to something bigger. I actually think, I think, I think the best way to describe a, a short story is it's a moment, and you're taking the advantage of like the absolute moment of this uh, of that that moment, that feeling, that action, whatever that might be, whatever that case actually might be, and you get it. And if you leave them wanting more, or if you leave them wanting something bigger and better. All the more, all the cool bonus. You've already started laying uh, the groundwork for that, and that, I think that's I think that's one of the cool things a short story can do. I I agree. I mean, they are very much a focused moment, a character moment, or a, a, an incident. Um, and yeah, it's like that laser focus with a short story. You have to pare away everything that doesn't serve the story. If, often, if you're going to meet your word length, <laughs> in particular. Otherwise, they quickly turn into novellas, or and then the next thing you know, you have a novel. So. <laughs> like, oh, okay. So as an editor, it's a really awkward thing. Like, let's I, let's say your cap is at fifteen hundred words, and that, that's a really short story for folks listening. Like probably four to six thousands, where most editors are like, okay, that's cool. But if you get something that's like six thousand and eleven, right? Like just like right, just over the edge, 
and it's really, really good. Are you that much of a stickler or do you like to say, I'll, I'll let it go? Not in these anthologies because I've capped yeah. at 6,000 words. I'm perfectly willing to take longer things. And I am because I already have one. I know that's coming in at 10,000 and somebody else said, like SM Sterling in the last one gave me basically a novella. I said, well, of course I'll take it. And he was willing to take the, the cap on the reprint for that. Um, because I don't have any particular word length on the book. It can be as thick as it is. I might have to charge more for the print version, but it doesn't affect the ebook uh, at no. all. Um, so um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to take the longer stories. These these anthologies are very much intended to be, well, I've used a couple of metaphors. The last uh, last anthology, I used the metaphor of the uh, cabinet of curiosities, this, this idea, especially in the, I guess it was the 17th century when these things popped up, 18th century. And the cabinet, they made a room. So it was like just a room of interesting things that they had collected in their travels. It could be artwork, it could be books, it could be artifacts, it could be fossils. And uh, that's kind of what these are. People keep asking me if they have a theme. And the only theme is I interviewed these people on my podcast. That's the only theme. And so there's everything from YA fiction to uh, far future space opera to urban fantasy to supernatural fiction to um, verging on horror. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's eclectic <laughs> and lengthwise as well. I'm, I, if if the author is willing to and mo uh, several authors did that because they had a story they wanted to write and it came in at 7,500 words. And I said, well, I'll take it if you're willing to, you know, abide by the cap. And generally they were so happy to have it published that they were fine with that. Yeah. I only rejected one story and it had nothing to do with length. It would have made it an X rated book. And I was aiming for more of a PG rated book. <laughs> that's fair. That, 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 that's very, very fair. Right. I, I mean, depicting something that, that could have happened is different than actually going into the details of what is happening. Right. So it's yeah. like, I, I get that. No, I, and you're, you're your own. I mean, so this is well, like. It's, it's a question of marketing as well. You don't want to have to put that explicit. Maybe, yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, I, I, I totally understand. No, I, I, I totally understand. Especially I'm when saying. you have a book that has YA stories in it as well. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, again, it's who's, it's all comes down to who's your audience or who's your intended audience. Right. What right? It, it's a broad audience and I, I, I'm keeping it. I want it to be a broad audience because as I said, I was reading these things when I was growing up anthologies and there's what really drew me into uh, science, fiction. science fiction more than novels. I think short stories to begin with and a few short novels that I read as a kid. And I would really love it if one of these anthologies was that gateway drug for, for a reader coming along now. Uh, you actually answered a question I was going to ask a little further down into this, into this, because again, we mentioned some of the old school science fiction um, anthologies here. It's like, yeah, you're trying to kind of, in one sense, capture that feeling you had when you were, when you were younger, you're like, I want to kind of have that feeling again, because if we're going to be honest, I think honestly, there is a market for this kind of thing. And it's, it's, there should be more anthologies like this out there every so often. Right, I think in bigger in bigger places, and they're not right now. So it's actually kind of well, cool to see see what you're doing. When I proposed this, I actually did talk to a couple of major publishers, or in my case, directly with Daw, um, and then uh, David Weber had actually uh, floated the idea with Tony Weisskopf at Bain for bringing out these anthologies. But it wasn't something that either one of them thought they could take on at that time. Bain does publish a lot of anthologies, but they're schedule was full because they have a lot of you know their own editors and and contributors and all that and daw used to do quite a few uh, anthologies and it just hadn't been working out well for them in the marketplace so they decided to back away from that so um so yeah. i ended up doing it myself with shadow pop press and that's worked out too well <laughs> I to so I, I guess i'll ask this like because of what you've done you kind of put yourself into a de facto like editing role. Like not, I'm not going to say like an Ellen Datlow exactly, but I mean, you're kind of like, you're in this, like you created a nice, interesting little niche for yourself. So again, you interact I'm with all the, these people, right? I'm the, I interview them. Um, mm -hmm. I collect their stories. I fund it. I edit it and I publish it. So it's very much, uh, I mean, obviously not a one man job because there's all the authors involved, but everything outside of the authors is me. Um, through Shadowpaw Press, which is named after our cat, and he's no help at all. <laughs> well, I'm sure he just looks, he looks on to like the cat scowl that a cat scowl just gives like, scar, right? You know, and that's kind of like the uh, the deal. No, it, it's really cool that this, your podcast has opened that door for you. I think that's a really, really interesting angle. I'm going the other way. I'm going into advertising with the podcast a little bit more. 
Um, I just have a really big mouth and I'm good at it. So I just figured I might as well just take advantage <laughs> of it that way. But um, no, it sounds like, I guess the big thing is like, because again, you, I think we always start off when we do stuff like this, like we want to just be writers. And what ends up happening, like not just with you, or but with me and a lot of other people is we get all these different skills, right? All these different skills, all these different doors you never expected to be going down. Like I'm sure if I had asked you, we'll say six years ago, but I think that's before you were really, you really thought had the concept of, of, of it. It's like, do you ever see yourself as a major editor for Nesology or some of the, like the biggest known names? And you'd be like, nah, but in the yeah, I wouldn't are. have seen a, wouldn't have seen a pathway to that at the time. Yeah. Um, so this, this popped up and, you know, it's just, it's putting pieces together and saying, well, somebody did this and I could do, that. and I had thought, uh, when I started Shadowfall Press, I had two things when I started Shadowfall Press, immediate projects. One was my own collection of short stories. I it took, I said, I don't write a lot of them. So every short story I'd written in my career, some of which weren't even published, it took to make a book of short stories of mine. But that was the first thing I put out, Paths to the Stars. And then uh, the second thing I knew I wanted to do was my grandfather-in-law's first World War memoirs, uh, which he wrote late in life. And I put that out, got it out just in time for the centennial of the armistice. So that was kind of my time frame to get that book out. And it got lots of great attention. It's probably my, one of my best-selling books from Shadowpot Press. It's, it's quite popular, at least locally. And it pop, you know, people buy it occasionally on Amazon, places like that too. Um, so th I had those two things. And then after that, my focus was largely on, for a while, uh, publishing the books of mine that had been orphaned by other publishers that went away. So I have several of those. I've killed a number of publishers, metaphorically, <laughs> in my career, or at least they've gone away after publishing me. Uh, so I wanted to get some of those out. And I still have some of those to bring out. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, but then uh, once, so I, but I, I put the pieces in place so I knew how to do this publishing thing, which was another huge learning curve to climb. And I'm still working on it. I mean, I'm still, I'm working with, you know, learning how to market better and do my data better and all that sort of stuff. Because yeah, I'm moving more and more into publishing stuff like this, which is not me, but other authors. So I have two novels coming out this fall that are, uh, I'm becoming a traditional publisher. Uh, I'm not a royalty. I'm a royalty paying publisher. I'm not an advanced paying publisher yet, but uh, I am becoming a traditional publisher and publishing other people. And these anthologies are kind of part of that side of my, my publishing empire, <laughs> me and the cat. <laughs> you and the cat taking over the world, man. I, there's a couple of ways. Okay. Do you mind we go a little bit down this rabbit hole? Because I've been, so for the last like few, I would say a few months I've been interviewing a lot. I, again, you mentioned earlier the Kickstarter community with comics. I know how big that is for the last, I'd say four or five months. I've been interviewing people or drawing with some of these creatives on the show. Right. So I know how big those Kickstarter empires are, right. Or can be, but the fact that you're going, and one of the reasons that I think this is happening, you, you kind of mentioned this offhand, you authors make their money on their backlist. It's a big part of their pay because I, I read an Edward Willett Edward Willett book, and it's like holy crap, the World Shapers is amazing, right? Where can I get more of Ed's stuff? Well, if there's no backlist, right? That demand gets lost, and I go look somewhere else. But if you have a place, it's like, well, I happen to have all my books here. Oh, cool! I'll just pick this one and this one and this one, and Ed, and you're like, yes. Right, a new right. I mean, because I, I, it's a great feeling. But I think what's happened in publishing, like the bigger publishers, smaller publishers are different. The bigger, the bigger publishing is, you would be what I think we call a midless author in bigger publishing, which yeah. is a, right at best. <laughs> at best, all right. But the thing is, but the thing is, nothing wrong with that. But twenty years ago. There would be a big backlist of your stuff available with all these different publishers, alive or dead, depending on how you killed them or not. But even even so, right? Well, the point the point I'm getting at is what's happened now with a lot a lot of authors have gone independent or like you doing Kickstarter or creating their own presses. And I think a big reason for that is you guys want to keep your work in circulation because from a business standpoint, just strictly on a business level. Your books are like your new books always you hope to do well, but it's not just your new book. Every time you create a new book or a new anthology, you're also advertising everything else you've done 
in the past. So now there's so what you're creating now is a place to access those things. Is that accurate? Yeah, although I'm, I mean, obviously, my books with DAW are still available at least oh, as yeah, an yeah. ebook. Yeah, um, because they keep that. That's all still there. But all the very small publishers I've worked with, as I said, a lot of them have just gone away over the mm -hmm. years. Yeah, and that stuff has come to me. And in the past, they would have just vanished into thin air unless you could find another publisher to take them on. And they're mostly worried about publishing new stuff, obviously. And on that note, I have actually started helping other authors. The other side, there's, I, I split Shadowpaw Press into two main imprints. Premier is this new stuff, like the anthologies. And uh, then um, I've started one, a side of it called Shadowpaw Press Reprise. That's where all the stuff that I've reprinted of my own has gone into. And uh, I have uh, Duotero, which is uh, Brad C. Anderson's uh, science fiction novel that was published by Bundoran Press. I will be bringing out in a new edition. Ooh, and these cool. are ebook and print on demand. I'm not doing a huge print run, but they will be out in all the online bookstores and available in both formats. Uh, I'm, and then I'm moving outside of science fiction. There's uh, Kato Books in Regina, which published my young adult series, The Shards of Excalibur, went under a couple of years ago. So all of those books were suddenly orphaned for a lot of authors. Uh, so I got Charge of Excalibur, and I'm, I'll put them out through Shadowpaw Press myself, except I have so many boxes of the original print ones. I have no great urge to print more copies at the moment. Uh, but uh, I'm printing printing a novel, a new version, a new edition of, uh, of a book called Stay by a poet, Catherine Lawrence. It's a, it's, a, it's a novel in verse, a young adult story in verse, nothing science fictional about it at all. Uh, she's an award-winning poet. It was nominated for Saskatchewan Book Awards. And she wanted somebody to bring it out, and she approached me, and I because I'd said I was doing this sort of thing, so I'm doing that. I'm bringing out another poetry book called uh, Phases by Belinda Betker, and yet I've also picked up uh, Leslie Gadala's uh, books that were published by Five Rivers, which is now also gone, another small press that's gone away. Uh, she has a series called Empire of Kaz, and another one called Legend of Sarah. I'm going to be bringing those out, and I'm open to that from other authors as well. They have to be previously published rights reverted work so these are works and these are authors who i mean they could easily do what i'm doing they could put it out independently but there are authors who aren't comfortable with that don't want to do that and if i think it's worthy of giving new life to uh, i'm willing to do the work of getting it out there and then we share whatever sales there are so it's an it's an experiment the first ones haven't even come out yet that aren't mine but they will be coming out and so shadow pop press the only thing I'm noticing is um, there's a lot of work. <laughs> oh, no, there, no, absolutely. No, it, it's this is why publishers, this is why publishing became such a like the way things go. I, uh, I, I, I just I, I asked this because I again, I've talked with some lots of people. I've known people like another crowdfunding example is Unbound based out of the UK. It's another it's another crowdfunding house. So I've talked yeah. to people that have worked there. I've seen people that have been like so. What I think is interesting is I think, well, publishing is decentralizing is how I would, I, how would I would actually say it. it's decentralizing. You have the really big publishers kind of slowly, for lack of a better term, cannibalizing themselves a little by little, right? And then you've got a bunch of, um, you have a bunch of presses like yours, like small, doing really, really cool things all over the map. Then you got like a wild, wild west. You have like Kickstarter, you have Unbound, you have Indie publishing you have there's like like i almost think like the the whole industry is evolving literally under our feet right now and i think that's a really cool moment so i'm at so this is where i'm gonna kind of want to what i'm gonna take with you you've become almost a traditional publisher mm -hmm. how do you see like but and that's and that's an interesting spot to be in right now but i there's... guess what i'm asking what i'm asking is this because traditional publishing is, itself is is going through an evolutionary phase in it, right in the middle of this, like do you see your like do you see that you publishing that way evolving, or are you just going through that yourself as you as as you go? Oh, it's definitely evolving, and one of the ways it's evolving is with uh, print runs. I mean, yep. the traditional model is you print a thousand copies and they sit in a warehouse and they get distributed if bookstores want them. Um, and I will be doing small print runs for some of these books, I think. Oh, there's so many things going on. I mean, it's it's not just the models that you can follow. 
There's also the fact that there is grant money available for me as a publisher in Saskatchewan. I, since I've started doing this, I've had uh, I, I, I picked up enough grant money so that I can offer um, concurrent audiobooks of the new books I'm publishing, which is The Amir's Falcon, which is a YA non-science fiction outdoor adventure by Matthew Hughes. Even though he's known as a science fiction writer, this is something he had that was not science fiction. And a new novel by a, a Saskatchewan writer named Pickwood, which is interesting because it combines uh, women's professional baseball and horses. So, you know, how can I nice. not market that? <laughs> that sounds like fun. <laughs> that right yeah. after the Second World War. Um, and so I'm going to be able to offer audiobooks because I was able to get grant money to pay for that production of, of those books with a, a narrator that I know very well who did my Shards of Excalibur books. There's grant money I picked up to help me as I work through building on my marketing, a marketing and development grant from Creative Saskatchewan. And when we get uh, probably at the beginning of May, it'll open up. There's a book production grant in Saskatchewan, which helps you defray the cost of publishing books in a traditional manner. So on the traditional side, there are things you can get that it's harder to get if you're self-publishing in particular. Um, they they're a little more reluctant to hand out money to somebody who says hey i'd like to publish my book there's they're looking for a track record and that you know what you're doing and that you'll be able to get it distributed and all that sort of thing and further down the road there when Cato books there are a couple of publishers that get through the saskatchewan arts board a substantial amount of of funding um, and i might at some point qualify for that my only caveat is that if I do that, I have to have an editorial board and it's no longer just me deciding what gets published. And the whole reason for starting this company was to publish whatever the heck I wanted. So you have there's that that weird balance if you get into the grants of my personal uh, political philosophy is more libertarian than anything else. I just want the government to stay the heck away from me. And I, me I, 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 I relate. <laughs> I totally relate and then, to that one. Yeah, but there's this money available, and you know, I'd be an idiot it, not to. It, it, have to it's take a advantage poison. Of it. Well, <laughs> it, it, it's so I, I just, I'll, I'll just keep, I just keep in mind. It's like it, it, it's um the the answer to some of the conversations I've had there at this point. I think with publishing is what serves you, right? Like whatever yeah. serves you, serves you. I best. just want to put out books, and I will yeah. do that. I'll do whatever I can to make that happen. I've discovered I really like publishing. I like publishing other people's work. I like editing. I've been a writer in residence at Saskatchewan Libraries, and uh, I I enjoy working with writers and editing. And I just I like the process. And I've discovered through the anthologies, I really like sending money to authors, especially yeah, if it's not my. Great. Book, but it came it's, from a Kickstarter. <laughs> no, it, it, it's great. I um so I, I'm kind of so one of my I'm my next book release I'm writing and drawing it never thought I'd do that in a million years but that's what I'm actually doing for my next release but the one after um have you ever seen uh, and, and and the one after I'm kickstarting it's basically I want to do a equivalent have you ever seen Darwin Cook's Parker novels like the actual have you ever seen them no they're beautiful books they're like take Darwin Cook like comic book artists take the part crime Parker novels like the actual novels and mash them together it's one of the most beautiful things in the world. I want to make one of those cool little things for myself because I is. So I found somebody I'm really, really excited to work with. So like that's going to be kind of the goal for the remain. Let's go. You might not see it until the end of the year, but at the end of the year, be like, hey, I'm kicks. I'm going to probably kickstarter this because I'm familiar with that community, but also because it's a really cool like thing. But when you're working with like people that are talented and artistic and have their own ideas of how to tell stories or be, be themselves, there's nothing like it. Like there's absolutely nothing like it. It's almost like you get this opportunity to become a fan all over again. Right. Because now, now, but now it's like in your particular case, you can give kind of like a bit of a gut you can teach. Because you've done quite a few books from your own right in your own name, you have an idea a little bit of what works and what does it. So you go, I can, I can help you. And then you get, and then sometimes they constantly surprise you just with what they did. It's like I never would have thought to tell the story like that. So freaking cool! It's almost like you get a second opportunity of being a fan again. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. And uh, you know, when we've been talking about the anthologies, these are all published authors and one. Yeah. And some of the international bestsellers, and you know. Um, I don't feel I have a lot to, to teach them, but when I'm working with uh, younger writers, and and I love doing that, and I've done it a lot. I've taught the Sage Hill Teen Writing Experience for three years. I was a writer in residence. Uh, I've edited. In fact, I'm editing right now. I'm managing editor and prose editor for Spring Magazine, which is the Saskatchewan Writers Guild puts out 
for emerging writers. So again, I'm working with writers who this might be their first their first published story is going to be the one that we'll be publishing in the magazine. And that that's that's just really cool. And um, when I was starting as a writer, um, I had some teachers that were quite supportive, which was nice, but it wasn't a writing community I was part of. The only writers group in the town I grew up in was elderly women writing stories about the depression. <laughs> oh, go and boy. My, my science fiction stories would not have fit in at their, at their meetings. They would have not known what the heck I was trying to do. Uh, and so I, I think it's nice that there are all these possibilities now, and the internet has made that possible as well. Uh, I was part of a, a critique group um, I can't remember what it was called now, run by Kathleen Woodbury back in the 80s and 90s, but it was all by mail. So you would send the manuscript off to a critique partner and three months later, if you were lucky, you'd get it back with the handwritten notes on it. Um, so the internet has made things like this and this whole kind of writing community, which is even a hashtag, right? Um, oh yeah. Uh, something that to a level that it just didn't exist when, when I was a kid back in the old days. So I talk to Cloud. I'm old enough to talk to clouds now, Ed. Sometimes they talk back. I've gotten to that point. So, but I, I bet that's like it's a cool thing because you get to see this science. Science fiction to me has always been the fiction of technology, innovation, change, and wonder. We're actually living in that kind of sort of in publishing right now because it's, because again the rules of how how things work are evolving literally before our feet. Right. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what that looks like in just five years. Right. I, I like, you know, just go back five years and see what people were saying and comparing to what, what we have now. And it's like anything I, whenever I'm looking up stuff and it says, when was this published? 2018. Oh, that's no good to me. That's ancient history. Yeah. No. That was last week if you're going to talk about the current state of publishing. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. No, it, it's just it's just like it's it's absolutely crazy. Um, But, yeah, it's like it's kind of cool. You ended up where you've ended up. That that's a. Yeah, you probably didn't picture that when you started, but I, but you sound very well, happy. As I said in the first one, in my my introduction to the first Shapers of Worlds, if you had told me in 1973 or four when I was reading The Forever War by Joe Haldeman that I would be publishing a, a short story, republishing a short story by Joe Haldeman in an anthology that I had edited, I would have said, nah. <laughs> nah it's, it's, it's... And that I would have met him and had dinner with him and all this, you know, it just, it seemed impossible back then that i would ever be part of the this community of, of authors that were like these gods on pedestals off in the distance somewhere and yet i've met many of the people that you know i've kind of met bob silverberg and joe haldeman and i once uh actually frederick pohl i once uh, helped him onto an elevator at a convention <laughs> so. okay now that's a guy I never would have had a chance to meet that um i was he was quite elderly at the time oh oh yeah no chair. No, like because I I discovered Pedro. Like, unfortunately, I was young, just young enough to discover Pedro Paul long after he passed on. It was just like he seemed really cool because he wrote some really cool stuff. It's just like I wish I could have met him, yeah. but never. Right for me, that was uh, Spider Robinson. I yeah. got to I got to meet him. So my story with Spider is the Vancouver when they did the last uh, science fiction con when they held for the, the Aurora is at. I actually was getting my Aurora pin and all of a sudden Spider Robinson's just wandering by. It's like, hey, Spider, come on in here. So they actually gave him a new pen. I actually gave him the new pen and I actually led to an opportunity to me to interview him, which is just, cool. oh, no, man. I, I think one of the coolest things about about um, like this time, like again, just the other aspect about technology being so great and wonderful, you have access to all these people now that you never would have considered having access to it would have been unthinkable for me to have a conversation with you like this even five years ago. I mean, it was possible, but it wasn't like something like thought of, but now it's yeah. like, so now I can, I can go contact, like I can go contact you. So, Hey, Ed, you want to come on my show? You'd be like, maybe, right. Right. If you want, right. And that'd be kind of like, right. enough for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. But that's just it. Like, that's like, that's the thing we have. I, the biggest things about today is it's accessibility. And speed, everything's so much faster today, and the access is a big part of today too. Which I think is, again, if you had asked all those people years and years ago, or even like with your anthology, right? It has allowed you to make all these connections to all these people you thought were unreachable. I think that might be the coolest thing about our time. 
just my opinion. I like it. Yeah. I'm doing the podcast and interviewing all the authors I've interviewed up to, I'm up to episode 107 now, I think. And congrats, you know, congrats. so uh, I only do it every two weeks. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just, I, I guess I'll keep doing it. <laughs> and since this Kickstarter succeeded, there will be a Shapers of Worlds volume four. Because at this point, whenever I interview somebody, I say, by the way, about later this year, I'll be asking you if you want to be part of this anthology. And almost everybody says, oh, sure, I'd love to. I'd love to do that. So uh, it's going to be another cool one next year. And hopefully it funds. Yeah, well, let's we'll talk about your show a little bit. And then we'll come, we'll come back to you, to your anthology for this for this year and, and kind of go. Um, again, 107 episodes. Congrats. I mean, that that's not an easy thing to do. I definitely know that. Um Again, has it kind of gotten like bigger than uh, beyond the anthology stuff? Has your show like surprised you in other ways? Um, only in that uh, it's it's you know that so many people are of such great stature in the field are willing to come on and, and talk to me. Um, I grew I drew on my connections right off the bat, right? So my first three were John Scalzi, Robert J. Sawyer, Tanya Huff, and then Julie Shernada. Those are my first four. And by the time I'd gone six months, I'd done Joe Haldeman and David Brin and Orson Scott Card and people like that. And then uh, in the new year, I was doing Victoria Schwab. And you know, so I just talked to Sherry Lynn Kenyon this last weekend. That'll be this weekend's episode. So the thing that surprised me really was, as you said, that you get you can get access to these people and that they're willing to come on. Um, it helped having those big names up front because then I could say, look, I've talked to these people and. But John Scalzi, it was funny because, as, as he himself will say, I was the first person he met in science fiction outside of his editor because he showed up late to the Toronto Worldcon in 2004, I think it was. And we were on the same panel, which was something about, um, you know, making a living when you could make a living from writing, the other things you could do. <laughs> he doesn't have that problem anymore. And uh, and he came running in and I was on the panel. I think maybe I was moderating it. So we met then and there. And so I drew on those connections that I've made at the conventions over the years. And uh, and then once you have, you know, people can look at the body, the body of work, as they say, and all the people I've talked to and say, well, this guy's probably somebody I can talk to and he won't be horrible. And generally I get compliments on my interviewing. So that makes me feel good. Um, yeah. And that's that's it hasn't really changed. It's it's a bit. In a way, it's formulaic. It's all about the writing process, and I go through the same formula every time. But everybody's biography is different, and everybody's the ways that they came to writing is different, and what they have to say about the process is different. From Peter V. Brett, who writes 150-page outlines, and this basically fills in the gaps, to um, well, Sherry Lynn Kenyon, I just talked to, who doesn't really do any plotting at all. She just launches in and knows kind of where she's going. <laughs> and I'm somewhere in the middle myself, but um, I call, yeah, I call it's, it's a been. It, and I guess the other thing is that occasionally now I get publicists and people like that contacting me wanting to get one of their authors on my show. Sometimes they're totally inappropriate. Like they don't clearly don't pay any attention to who it is they're reaching out to. And they say, hi, I've got this this uh, spiritualist who wants to be on and talk about right. religion. Like, That's not quite unless it's an alien religion created for a book. Not really what I'm focused on here. Okay, uh, uh, aside. So, if someone talked about the flying spaghetti monster religion on your show, would that be? Is, would that fit? Because it's kind of in that. I could see it coming up, although it has not. And the... <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I just, just, just a friendly aside. It's like it's like I, 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 I mean, I, I totally be down there listening to that episode of you conducting that. <laughs> That'd be cool. Um, no, I, the reason I asked that is because I just I've done a lot of shows too, and what I've learned is that like it the show evolves as time goes on like partly because you do so many of them right that you like it's i'm not saying you're 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 bored exactly but you try different things sometimes on your shows too and sometimes they work really really well sometimes they don't right All right but i'm i mean that's something i i guess with me and it's so like again when we did this interview years ago i think at this point this was a strictly an audio show. This is live on yeah, Twitch. Right, right. This is live on I Twitch. I still just do audio. I don't 
I don't do video. I just want to keep it as audio because I don't want to have the pressure of looking good when I'm talking. <laughs> eh, I, 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 ha I have very little shame. No, it's more, it just, uh, I, I just realized like it was just a natural progression for where the show was going. I've always had like a, my own kind of vision of where I wanted to take the show and it's, I'm making it get closer and closer to that vision. But again, there's nothing wrong with just being an audio show either. It's just, where are you come again, going back to something I said earlier, what serves you right but i am curious like you say it hasn't involved that much like do you see like would you i guess from the for with the format of your show again writing process writing craft would you do stuff like for example like a writing workshop on your show for example or some or try something along those lines or are you just comfortable exactly where it is i think it would st it'll stay where it is if i were going to do something like that i'd probably start an uh, auxiliary podcast of some sort under a different uh -huh. title to keep the brand what it is um, and I could certainly, and, and, you know, I have a, I have a YouTube channel as well. It doesn't have a lot of writing stuff on it, but I post, you know, interviews that I'm in. And then I also post my, my live streamed walks around Regina that I do almost every day. You can walk around Regina with me on my YouTube channel. That's um, cool. and shadow pop press now is a YouTube channel. So I hope to do some author interviews on there that would be video, although that will be focused on the authors that I'm publishing, but there's getting to be several of those. So I do hope to do some on there. So okay, things yeah. will things will continue to evolve, <laughs> but I think the World Shapers itself is uh, the format works uh, and it is it's focused. If you you know what you're getting when you listen to a World Shapers podcast, you know it's going to be an author talking about their creative process. It's right there in the title: um, science fiction, fantasy authors talking about their creative process. I put it in the subtitle. So <laughs> no, it, it's it's cool. I I just asked that because again, you, you you've done a, again over 100 episodes is just the show i i just found with me my show just evolved as i did maybe just well I, it's i mean it, it obviously evolved some and in the way that the questions are phrased some early questions that i used to ask all the time i gradually went away because i got away from uh you know i felt i had them answered um but generally it's and i i it's pretty it's pretty formulaic i guess in a way <laughs> but that works for me for what i want to do there's there's nothing wrong with formula though like I, you know i something i something um I realized like with novels, like, like most things in the world, having a way that works and just following it because it works isn't in itself a, a crime. The thing, the thing that, that makes a good show, a good, good like place of business, a good book, a good piece of art is what you bring to the process. The fact that you use a formula is not in of itself a bad thing at all. It's, it's, it, it's just, it keeps you honest. Like, okay, how do I measure up to here? It's good to have a standard, you know what I mean? Well, and one of the things I like about it as well is that it's obviously my audience, it'll be fans of the writers, but it's also quite likely to be other writers who want to hear how writers do things, right? Yeah, Cause exactly. it is about, you know, how do you out, what kind of outlining do you do? And what, what does your revision process look like? And all those sorts of things. Uh, but the other nice thing about keeping them mo mostly along the same lines each time is that you can compare then you can go and see well i heard what uh, larry korea said about this i'm going to go see what uh shauna mcguire said about outlining or whatever very different writers and you can you can get that sense and i do actually <laughs> another thing i want to do with my copious free time I, I do at some point want to create a book drawing on all this this material i have from other writers talking about their writing process um, I've actually got a, an application for a grant in right now that that came nice. through. I'd be doing that book uh, it would be something that would immediately take priority because I would be paid to work on it. But uh, it, that's something else I think could come out of the out of the uh, podcast. Probably more than one book because that's a hundred and some hours of interviews at this point. Well, yeah, I just just me when I do freelance writing. I have like my podcast is a goldmine of information. Because you just yeah. everybody everybody has their own unique insights, and there's so much to learn all the time, right? I never stop learning any show I do because I, everybody. I used to do full transcripts, but I gave up on that. Oh no, that no, that's the I oh I couldn't at this point. I don't. If I had a staff, maybe I would, but I I I yeah no, you just they were they were automated, but the automated ones still take took four hours to clean up for a one hour. Uh, podcast yeah. and i just got to the point where i needed those four hours for other things Yo, and yeah. i also discovered that nobody was like looking at my site stats it wasn't like people were spending enough time on the site to be reading those transcripts so i don't think they were nobody has complained about the fact that i quit doing them i feel a little guilty i feel like i've 
let myself down, but oh well. At least I have I more hours. Do you, well, I, I somehow feel you'll find, I, and it sounds like you're, you're doing all kinds of other endeavors now. It's giving you more time to get yourself into all, in the good, best kinds of trouble, which I think all things considered, if that's a failure, I, I could live with that personally. It sounds yeah, like you are too. That failure. <laughs> yeah. No, it, I, I, the only time I, the only time I've ever really transcripted was again, the spider interview is the only one I transcripted. And that was because I was asked and asked to do it and paid to do it. And otherwise I wouldn't, I like, I just wouldn't have done it. Um, well, if I get this grant to work on the book, part of the work will be taking the ones that I have not yet transcribed and running them through at least the automated transcription so that I have them in some textual form, yeah. which makes it much easier to pull out quotes and things like that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that, that alone will take um, hours. <laughs> even Days. Even Probably days. Yeah. Yeah. Even the, just the process of uploading them and getting them uh, transcribed. I used... Uh, sonics.ai i think is the transcription service that i use yeah and it was pretty good it it could be funny it, it you know we have a term in the field of pantsers people who don't plot their pantsers p-a-n-t-s-e-r yeah it invariably turned them into panzers like the german tank <laughs> nice <laughs> I, 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 you I, a panzer or a plotter <laughs> I, I i i actually call myself a planter is what i do it's i i i have a i have um i know where the story's going generally Right, right, and I know where my beginning is, and the middle's kind of sometimes like the middle. I have a little idea, but I don't uh, pawn it too deeply because like, what is what I find happens to me. I don't know if this happens to you. Is sometimes my characters say, "No, we're gonna, we're, we're going that way now." I, I've learned I learned that making a plan and being too committed to a plan almost never works. It's just better to like have an idea where you're going, have that compass. So if you get lost, well, you can kind of come back. So. I, what happens is, at least with my DAW books, I'm selling those based on a synopsis. I say, Sheila, I'd like to do this story. Here's five pages explaining the story. So I have that synopsis. But typically, I start writing, and I don't look at it unless I get to some point where I think, I'm not sure what happens next. Maybe there's yeah. an idea in the synopsis. And then I'll take a look. And oh, yeah, I for completely forgot I was going to do that. That might be better than what I'm actually doing. Or maybe that's not. <laughs> and I've also gotten to, uh, like, 20,000 words from the end and my plot has gone so differently that the original synopsis is not going to work and I have to completely replot even where I thought it was going. And characters, you know, I put in a character in one book just because I needed a viewpoint character up in space while my other characters were on the planet's surface. But in developing that character, they became a major character and actually had an enormously important role to play later on. And they didn't even exist in the synopsis. So. No, it happens, right? That's the thing, like when you put together a book, you, you sometimes think like, hey, I got this nailed down. And then, nope, no, no, you don't. It's going to go that way. And you're just going to go, okay, I'm well, going that way. I've learned not to like, fight it too much unless I get really lost. And it's like, okay, got to gotta pull back, see what I'm doing. But and, but unless I'm, I'm in that point, um, yeah, so I call myself a planter. I do have an idea, but I don't always go that way. It's just like that. I, I, I think that's, so that's, I think that's, that's the uh, compromiser planter. So, yeah. yeah. The process of writing change. No, there's the old saying about no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Well, no synopsis survives contact with the writing process either. Mm -hmm. They're just two different things. They're just skimpy little notes. You might say, you know, hijinks ensue <laughs> on one page because you don't know what's going to happen yet until you get there. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite yeah. that, but I'm pretty close to that. You know, and after various adventures, they reach. <laughs> If, 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 I, if I see if I ever write my own reading my high jinx and so then my inner voice goes oh no <laughs> it's like what does that mean but no it sounds it's but um all right go go in full circle as we get towards the end of this this bad boy um dude first off congrats I mean I think I think that it's really cool that you've you've established yourself on Kickstarter and did it ahead of time because um I think I how is the, how are you with the Kickstarter community? Like, do you have a good good rapport there? Kind of. Sort I don't of? even know what that means. I I don't know what the Kickstarter community is. It's just me. <laughs> it's just no. I I well because I get occasionally somebody will contact me and we'll exchange. You know, here's another cool project that you might want to follow, and we put that in our updates. But uh, I have talked to like when I started, I had advice from uh, Arthur Slade who had kickstarted a graphic novel, graphic novel version of one of his books. And I, he had succeeded. And I talked to him about that. 
And Josh, uh, uh, I'm looking at you, Josh, and thinking of the other Josh, Josh Palmet here, who does yeah. uh, uh, Zombies Need Brains. And I've, I've written stories for those anthologies. And he's really got it down to a science where he's cranking out those Kickstarters successfully. I think three times a year he's, he's kickstarting an anthology. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I had some great advice from, so that was my Kickstarter community was two people who had done it before, but as running the Kickstarter itself, I, you know, I, I don't go to forums. I don't talk to other people about how they're doing it. I'll occasionally look at somebody else's Kickstarter, but I just kind of did it the way that that felt right to me. <laughs> no, that's, that, that, that's fair. No, I, I, I'll ask, cause again, we mentioned like comic book communities. I just know this from my own, my own interactions with them. There are some really tight knit groups in those communities that, that mm -hmm. support each other with all these like different projects. Like, uh, for example, as, as an example, um, there's two an anthology going around. There's two Cthulhu anthologies going on right now. So they are actually co promoting each other and supporting their books. You know what I mean? So like, there's like if you get both books, you get a special pledge kind of deal. You know what I is mean? One of those Cthulhu is hard to spell. Yes. Yeah, because he reached out to me and we exchanged. Yeah, no, that, that that is, the, and for those people who are wondering, that is Russell Nolte. I know, I know, I know exactly who he is. I actually interviewed a bunch of his people that were doing that, and I almost actually was in the uh, Cthulhu Invades Wonderland. I was a little late, and I was working on a show for an immigration company that kind of got crazy right when I was supposed to hand in something, so I never could. So, um, but no, but they're working together and they're kind of kind of promoting. It. So I wonder if you did have a community around you because like. Because I mean, there is there is that possibility. Like you meet working again, maybe with Josh, right? Not me and the other Josh he's talking about, folks. And and maybe going. He like, he promotes it a little bit himself, and you know, because I have that connection. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a small community. It's two of us. <laughs> yeah, but, but hey, but it, it, it's it's an extra voice, right? It doubles the it doubles the output. That's why I'm, I'm just bringing well. That and up. the other thing I have going for me, of course, is all these authors. Yes, uh, I. I think they could do more, of course, to promote it, but uh, most of them, you know, are, are promoting it in their newsletters or to their fans on Twitter, and they'll, you know, retweet stuff that I tweet. Uh, it depends on the author, and some of them are extremely busy, and I'm a very minor part of what they're focused on at the moment, and I, I understand that. I don't really mind, uh, but they all do something. They all provide, not all, but most of them provide really great uh, backers' rewards, some amazing backers' rewards. Sometimes uh, I'm a little disappointed, actually, at some of the ones that aren't going in the current Kickstarter because there are Zoom chats with authors available, like a Kathy Clash, as they call them at conventions, a virtual one. And the only one that's gone was with Walter John Williams um, at $400 Canadian, which is only about 300 Well, it was when I started. I think the exchange rate has changed, but mm -hmm. um, U.S. Uh, one of those went, and he, there's only four available there, and the others haven't gone. I know that's a fairly high bid, but I thought with Walter John Williams, that wasn't such a bad such a bad no, thing. It, it, the it, others are cheaper, but uh, they haven't gone. And uh, also the Tuckerizations, the only one that's gone is mine. Those are still available. And uh, there are, oh, the other one is uh, Jane Yolen will write a poem for a backer based on information that they provide, like a personal. She will write you a unique a cool Jane one. Yolen poem. And only one of those has gone. And I, everybody is, uh, I don't know if it's, uh, I do get the feeling on this one that perhaps well, I shouldn't say that because somebody did come in with a huge, took a whole bunch of, you know, took $750 or something they pledged, which was very helpful. But, uh, and a lot of that uh, seems to be a bit more down at the lower level. You always get more of those than anything else. The people going for the eBooks mm -hmm. then the trade paperbacks, which are more expensive. But I'm still, some of those backwards rewards, I really thought people would snap those up. So I, that's I, the one I, thing about the Kickstarter you just don't know. <laughs> well, I have a theory with the Zoom ones, if you want to hear my theory. I think it's because, sure. I, I think by and large, even though they are well-known authors and names, Zooming out. Like, I mean, I, I know about you for the last two years, I've done an awful lot of Zoom, right? I get the, I get the, I get meeting someone's really cool, but... I think maybe it, I think it might just be like that zoom, like, maybe. yeah, know. it's, uh, and that's just, a, maybe come, a, that's a, as I didn't take that because of this, then I have no way to know. Uh, but I was glad that the one went and Walter yeah. John Williams at the moment. It's that one. It's a one-on-one -on -one for that particular back, which is, which cool. is, which is super cool. And the genuine poem that actually sounds amazing, <laughs> like absolutely amazing. So maybe I priced them too high. I don't know. I can't change no. them because 
somebody took one, but I put them at 250. But that's 250 Canadian. You know, that's under 200 dollars US. So actually, sometimes, sometimes weirdly enough, you might not have priced it um, high enough. It's a weird so like. Maybe- no, I know it sounds weird, but like, like I, uh, I something again. Go looking at this. Yes, I know it's Brandon Sanderson. Looking at some of the actual tactics he employed with with his Kickstarter, like he has some. None of his stuff. None of his tiers are cheap. None of them, right? But people invested in them because I I equate to what I call a Disneyland experience. You go to Disneyland, you know you you and your money are going to part ways forever and ever and ever and and to things that if there'd be anywhere else in the world would be significantly cheaper. But you're doing it because frankly it's a one of a kind unique experience, right? Kickstarter the other thing about Kickstarter is it's kind of like Disneyland in one sense. There is a significant chunk of audience that wants to be spoiled rotten. Right. It's not just people that just like the lowest common denominator. I'm trying to afford what I can. There's also another group of people that are like, I have money to burn. What kind of really cool experience? Right. Do you well, have- I think this is the guy, this bibliophile from the UK that contacted me and took a whole bunch of yeah. stuff. It was it was. Uh, and you notice when you're looking at your backers, you get, you know, first time backer backed a couple of things. But then there's always these people back 737 projects back. You know, they yeah, live on exactly. Kickstarter. Some of these people, they're super backers. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. Like there, there is um there's an odd there's a bunch of different audiences out there for authors to look at. On Kickstarter, there, I, I just mentioned three of them, right? The big Disneyland, the people that are like, you know, looking for to afford what they can. And then there's also another group that just will like you have a one dollar tier, right? That doesn't get anything, but people do get throw one dollar at, at projects just because they want to support the arts in their own way. I think five is my lowest. But, oh, yeah, but, 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 but the concepts, the there's same, always right? the Kickstarter puts up the one that says, you know, pledge what you can. I think you can put any amount in there. Yeah. Yeah. Occasionally exactly. you'll go pledge from somebody that wants to sell you something later on. And they want you to use them for, for something related to fulfilling the Kickstarter. That's another way that way. That's how they follow the project is by throwing $1 on it. So yeah. I've seen that. Yeah, so exactly. So it's one of those. It's one of those situations. Where there's a bunch of different audiences on Kickstarter. Yeah. So sometimes it, it's weird. I, and this again, this is just a lesson I've learned as a freelancer. If you price it too cheap, no one buys it. If you price it, but so sometimes when you raise the price, that novelty actually increases sales. It's a strange thing. It doesn't always work, obviously, but it is something I am aware of. It's like sometimes, like, did I price it too low? I, yeah, I actually a, do think about that yeah. sometimes, right? It's not something a lot of authors think about, but it's it's true, you know. So it's it's yeah. But I hate pricing myself. And I'd rather make me an offer and I'll tell you if it's enough. That's actually my yeah, no, and that, that, that's that's <laughs> fair. No, no, that's fair. But but I mean, it, unfortunately, it's it's part of the nature of, the, uh, of yeah. the business. The rule I follow: a former friend of mine gave me this advice. It's probably the best I've ever heard. When you ever try to price yourself, you close your basically close your eyes. Figure out in your head what will cost you to do this thing without resenting it, right? When yeah. there's no resentment, it's fair. Then what you do just to be on the safe side, and this is just my little addition, go 10% higher. That way you can negotiate down so you never go below that part where you resent it ever, right? So that's that's what right. I've learned. That's what I've learned, right? And, and that was being what being a freelancer has taught me. Um, so I, I just say that like, it's weird because yeah, you it sounds really strange. It's like, I hate pricing myself, but... You're in the upbeat place where you kind of have to, you know what I mean? So it's just like, yeah, it's it's a weird, it's a weird um, balance, and I'm sure each and every time you do a campaign, you learn more and more. I would kind of what the, what works well, does. I actually priced my my level down on the Kickstarter from the last couple of years. I started at sixteen thousand. I went to fifteen thousand last year, and this time I put it at twelve thousand, partly because. Um, Sometimes the fact that you fund actually brings more people to your project because they know they will get whatever yeah. the backers rewards are. I haven't noticed that effect, but there's still six days to go. And there's also there's always a surge at the very end Absolutely. as the messages go out to the followers saying this ends soon, you know, check it out. Uh, so I hope I get uh, if I get another up to 17,000, I can offer the authors an extra penny a word, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's something. It adds up. And, it will also help actually cover some, you know, I, I'm kind of underpricing myself at 12000 uh, So I may have to, eventually I make the money back because I sell books, but I 
I'd rather do that sooner rather than 20 years down the road because I may not be here 20 years down the road. That's fair. No, that's, that's fair too. I, I am going to run a Kickstarter for my own novel, I think. Uh, later this year, I'm going to try that for the first time. I'll price that fairly low in the hope that it goes over quite a bit. But uh, either the the next World Shaper book, because Daw didn't want to continue the series, or um, possibly continue the E.C. Blake Masks of Agrima fantasy trilogy, because there were more stories to be told there. The trilogy was complete, but I wouldn't mind extending it. So I'm kind of toying with that idea and seeing seeing if I can get all that Brandon Sanderson magic. Somehow I won't think I'll get $21 million in the first day, but you never know. No, but, but, <laughs> but so this is what I'm doing. I'm, I actually plan to like my first Kickstarter is going to be, I have a Alice in Wonderland Greek mythology mashup. Alice mm-hmm. Pandora, she opens the box and Wonderland scatters across a multiverse and, she, and she's lost trying to find her way home and restoring Wonderland at the same time. So cool. I'm having a blast with that. Cool. Right. Well, I, I came up with this idea of doing like a, a snakes and ladders board game style map. But when I did that, I accidentally invented a board game. So when I do my Kickstarter for Alice, it's going to be a book board game combination. Cool. Yeah. Because I, again, that's the other, that's expensive the other pardon. Expensive to produce potentially depending on. I'm not worried about that. I, I look at it, I look at it like this. I look at it like this. It's one of those situations where, again, you have a very passionate community on Kickstarter, right? You have a very passionate community on Kickstarter. I've actually talked to a couple of places in Calgary, kind of what I'm looking to do to create like kind of a special edition board game. Not as, as expensive as you might think, actually, right? The initial the initial one to build. I don't really have a clue. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I, I've been, I've been quietly looking, doing, doing like the math in my head to see what's possible. Realizing too that some people will just want the book, some people might just want the board game, some people will want both, and then maybe something like a special edition, like something like, like something that's like unique just to the Kickstarter campaign, right? Um, the reason I, I'm doing it, I'm thinking about doing it like that is, um. I can use the board game to extend the story I'm telling in the in the in in the stories because games in themselves are storytelling devices or can be. So that's what I'm doing. Um, but it's something I can't do with a traditional publisher because, right, as you so eloquently put it, mass producing a board game isn't necessarily the cheapest thing in the world to do. And even if it's an Alice in Wonderland variant, that doesn't guarantee that from a publisher's point of view that. Um, I'm going to make I'm going to make the bank back for that publisher. However, can I find? Do I think I can find somewhere between 100 to 200 people willing to buy an Alice in Wonderland themed board game on Kickstarter? I think so. I there, there may that might be a cocky ass, but I I mean I could, I could totally see. I, I think I could. I think likely. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You'd think that, right? So it's just it, it's but again, it's understanding like like again, Kickstarter is not. You don't need a big audience necessarily in Kickstarter. You just need, in your case, I mean, the way I would look at a novel or a book would be like this. Can I get 100 people to invest 30 bucks into my work? Just just to simplify that concept. If the answer is yes, you can make a successful Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. But it. That that that's my big and deep and wonderful thought of the day. But that's that's me. I'm I I am a money grabbing freelancer, and I'm just thinking like, how can I make money with this? And maybe that sounds really really terrible, but it's who I am. No, I, I'm a freelancer. I totally get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally right. And just it's just recognizing it's just recognizing what I I think like I've I said, had a real I, job in 28 years. So I'm trying to keep it that way. I've had a real job in two years. I'm trying to keep it well, that way. I had a contractor there, but they still, I had to go to a place for a while, but it wasn't a real job. It was just a contract job. Yeah. No contract jobs. Aren't, I, I I had one of those too. I did. I just did it. I did a, a, a YouTube based immigration show. I built a show from scratch, a video show from scratch. So kind of fun, but I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to do some other things. We'll, we'll, we'll see if I can avoid the real job thing going forward. I'm going to try <laughs> it. I'm going to try. So, but that all said, you got five days left. So you you just funded then, like you just funded? Uh, it funded uh, three three days ago, I guess. Two days ago, three days ago. Uh, it's gone up a little bit more. It's at one hundred and three percent, I think, as of today. Uh, with uh, it ends at uh, ten a.m. 
Saskatchewan time, noon Eastern daylight time, uh, next Thursday will be when it ends. And we'll see, I'll see what the grand total is at that point. But oh, it's yeah. definitely a go. I'm already getting, uh, authors are already sending me stories. Some sent me stories before I even launched the Kickstarter, which I thought showed great faith in my ability to succeed again. Um, and then it'll be um, getting the stories, sending out the contracts. I pay immediately upon accepting the story and uh, editing. And then all of the publishing stuff, of building the book and sending out page proofs and and all of that. And based on my previous timelines, I would expect that it will go, uh, it'll be available October, November, somewhere along in there. Yes. And folks, you can, you can find Shaper Worlds Volumes 1 and 2 at local bookstores. I actually, in, I'm in Canmore right now. It's there. I actually, oh, cool. I, I'm, I'm probably going to steal one before I, when I get out of Canmore and in, into Calgary Book Camp, I'm going to grab it. Actually, yeah, so they're this, available on every online bookstore, and you can even uh, download them directly from shadowpawpress.com. You can buy the ebooks directly from me, and I make more money that way. So, <laughs> so, so uh, we we can talk about that in about a week, and we'll we'll kind of see how it goes. But before we do that, I have one last evil question, and we'll actually officially plug the Kickstarter. And that's this: I'm I'm going to be evil here. Um, I'm not going to ask what your favorite story is because you're not going to give me that answer for a couple of reasons. One, it's probably damn near impossible to name it, but I will ask this in your anthology. I, I speak as someone that's worked in a, in magazine. Sometimes you just get a story that you, again, you can, you know, you have an idea kind of what you're expecting from them. Because you, you talk about it at least a little bit. What is there a particular story either from this anthology right now, or, or from a previous anthology that just oh, like over delivered on your expectations for it. It just like, like, holy cow, is this good? That's pretty much the same thing as asking what my favorite story is. No, no it's I can't not quite. Not quite. I can't not speak quite. to the current anthology because although I've received a couple of stories, I've only read one of them. Uh, the others I haven't even looked at yet because I didn't know if we was going to fund or not. Uh, so I can't really speak to those. Of the previous two, oh, let me just, I actually have both of them here in front of yes, me. Go ahead, show, show them to the audience. Uh, that's the original one, Shapers yeah. of Worlds. And that's Shapers of Worlds Volume 2. And let me just take a quick look to see who's here, which ones really spoke spoke to me. Or, well, putting us. Putting aside the reprints, because I had like, you know, Hugo Award winning story from Joe Haldeman in the reprints. Uh, looking at that one. This one. I think one of the most interesting ones, I like them, you know, and again, this is not saying it's the best story, but one no. that I did find very, very interesting. And pretty much what I would expect from this author was uh, Candace Jane Dorsey's story, Going to Ground. Uh, which starts with this person in jail who's crafting spiders out of her eyelashes or his eyelashes. I'm not sure it's entirely sure the gender of the of the person. Um, and it's just a really fascinating story. It's got, I think there's a multiverse connection and there's genetic engineering and it's all told in a very interesting, it's, it's the kind of story that that I can remember running across in anthologies when I was, a kid and they would have been kind of weird for me at the time but i've grown to kind of like them a, a bit more so that one is one that really it didn't really surprise me because i expected that level of story from candace jane dorsey but i was very pleased with it and it's one that's kind of always sticks in the back of my head as something that was that was different very 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 cool give me a second here i am looking for your there it is and you were funded actually according to this According to this, you were funded five days ago, which is kind of cool. So congratulations on that. So what I'm doing here for, for caught up for, as much post funding as I would like, but it's it's still it's still crawling up there. And ladies and gentlemen, that is his Kickstarter project right now, Shape Our Worlds Volume Three. Uh, is so. I, and the last question I'll ask about Shape Our Worlds. So you say you, you have a wide, diverse like range of stories in each one. Have you ever thought like going to try like, a more theme based one down the road, or are you just going to do you just enjoy the diversity? Because of the way that this is set up, uh, no, I like yeah. the fact because I the the authors are also very different. You've got international bestsellers, you've got people on their first or second books, you've got a few in, indie published 
uh, authors, uh, and they're all writing different kinds of things. And what I want it to be is a showcase of the authors who have been on my podcast. And I like the diversity. Um, I like all these different approaches to things. So if I might do a themed anthology at some point, but it would be a separate project. And in that case, I'd probably have some sort of open submissions as well. Okay. Uh, I have thought about the thing as well. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you seem to have become a, pu a publishing, uh, uh, you know, you're creating a little publishing empire over, over in your little corner. It seemed to be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, may maybe it's your cat creating it and you're just working for the cat. I don't know. I mean, that, 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 I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, but, but it sounds to me like, honestly, I'm very, it's really interesting to see where your road has taken you, my friend. Congratulations on all your success. Congratulations on getting funded. And hopefully, and hopefully these things continue going forward. And uh, hopefully next time you're ready to do it, you're more than welcome to come back and talk about it anytime you like. I would be happy to do so. Alrighty. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that for today. So before we go, I'm gonna plug my latest book. This is called Alice One. Alice chases the queen of hearts over the edge of the world and ends up in the Greek underworld where to escape, she must play croquet against Jason of the Argonauts. In the Greek underworld, Alice and company encounter gods, monsters, and most of all, themselves. Written by yours truly, illustrated by Kenzie Carr. It's available on Amazon now. And that will do it, ladies and gentlemen, for this week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Stay inspired. Keep shining in the dark. And I will see you guys next week.